What's up, friends? I'm Kat Jones, and you're listening to Hot Blooded, the podcast where I talk to musicians about love, rock and roll, and anything else that comes up along the way. This week's guest is Nate Garrett, who is the singer and songwriter and guitarist of the metal band Spirit Adrift. If you're not familiar with Spirit Adrift, the best way to describe them is probably just that they sound like a completely timeless metal band, like the heaviest and most beautiful parts of Black Sabbath and the fun of Judas Priest and Thin Lizzy, but all with a touch of this really palpable anguish in each song that feels a lot deeper than many bands these days who get the doom metal tag slapped over them. And one of the reasons for that is, as Nate will go in depth about in this interview, only a handful of years ago, he nearly died of alcoholism. When he finally decided to get clean and the world opened up again, the first ever Spirit Adrift songs just kind of came soaring out of him. So this band has been the soundtrack to a time that is not only extremely heavy and dark, but also hopeful and triumphant as he has this new lease on life. And I really love this band. Anyway, I've worked with Nate a handful of times. Um, He used to be the guitarist of the death metal band Gate Creeper, when I booked and produced the K-Pit video for Kerrang! in New York. And I've interviewed him about Spirit Adrift live on Instagram for my current day job. And I've even over the years written little snippets here and there about bands he used to be in long ago. So I've done a ton of research about Nate and his inspiration behind his projects along the way. And he has always been very open about his battle with alcoholism and the very dark times in his life as a result. Because that whole era of his life paved the way for Spirit Adrift to exist. In several interviews I've read with him, he has mentioned a conversation that he had with his girlfriend, Nicole, who's now his wife, where she looked at him and said, you don't even smell like liquor, you smell like death. It was in that moment where he decided to go to detox and start his recovery. Now, in life, and especially in working in rock and roll and heavy metal, You see this kind of thing happen all the time where one person really needs help with their addiction and they have a partner who's just trying everything to get them to pull their life together. And in the end, the motivation and impetus has to come from the addict themselves. Otherwise, it causes a weird cycle of resentment and fights where the other person at some point has to decide if they're just going to give up and move on. So... I got really intrigued about Nate's relationship and the events leading up to that moment. Like, what types of conversations had they had about his deadly alcoholism leading up to that point? And had there been any ultimatums in the past? And also, how did she support him once he decided to get and stay sober? And how was their relationship affected as a result? And also, goddamn, he must love her a lot. So, what's their dynamic like? So... I loved talking to Nate and hearing his answers to these questions, which is no surprise because Nate rules. But before we dive in, I just wanted to quickly say that I think it's possible that a lot of people listening right now might really relate to the things that Nate is saying here in this interview or the experiences that he's had. And if you're struggling with drugs or alcohol, you're absolutely not alone, especially in the music world. And there are lots of people who love you and want to see you happy and healthy and There are probably tons of resources in your area for meetings, detox, or rehab that can help you get the help you need. Um, And I hope Nate's story and his music inspires you. I feel like I should ask you the question that everybody wants to know, which is, how are your puppies doing? <laughs> they're good. They're uh, they're great. They turned into good dogs finally. Um, we it was like one honestly, like that was probably one of the biggest challenges of my life uh, the past couple of months or whatever, just because they were their original living situation was so terrible, and they were literally like wild animals not the figure of speech wild animal just literally actual wild animals um and just trauma and 
you know, they they just they came from a bad place, and we've been trying forever to get rid of their fleas. Yesterday, we took them to a new vet um, in the city. Went went to town, as they say, and uh, <laughs> took them to a vet in Austin, and they gave them some legit flea medication finally they were technically a little bit too young but it's been such an impossible task trying to get the fleas to go away and then yesterday after we uh got the pills and everything i gave him the pills and probably like an hour later hank was right next to me on the couch i just kind of rolled him over and there were like 30 dead fleas just like laying on the couch wow so uh yeah i feel so bad for him um we tried everything literally everything um, and then fleas can turn into worms. So it's, it was just like an endless cycle of that. Um, but man, they, uh, as far as behaving and everything, they're awesome. They're, they're really awesome. All the hard work and suffering really paid off, uh, on the training end. And now I I can tell they feel better now too, that the fleas are gone. So they're yeah, great. Yeah. I bet, I bet having fleas would be. A reason that they might act out because they're just like, please, I don't, I can't speak English to tell you <laughs> that I'm really uncomfortable right yeah. now. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, and um, like I said, we tried everything, you know, but we just we kind of bit the bullet. The doctor said, even though they're technically a little too young, it's it's not an issue. This is just kind of more of like a liability thing, um, right? But they're good. They're good. Even before yesterday, they were. It's like they just. They're growing up. They're losing teeth. They're getting personalities. They're they're cool. They're like turning into dogs. That's adorable. I remember last time we talked, um, when we did that interview for the pit, you were like, When I first got them, I thought I might have made a terrible mistake. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Like they, I mean, sounds funny and it is I guess it is funny now, but dude, they're I don't I don't know a lot of people that could they could do what we've done in the last couple months. It was it was chaos, but with everything else that's going on, too. I mean, I don't think we were really emotionally prepared to get new dogs yet. Um, we had a dog for seven years named Lizzie who passed away uh, January second, and it's just like my wife and I have been through some really terrible thing like some some of the worst stuff that can that a person can go through you know like family members dying parents dying relatives committing suicide relatives going to prison i mean a lot physical mental abuse uh a lot of which on my part was self-inflicted you know just all kinds of shit Mm -hmm. but i i think there's something about losing that dog that was like it's it's been like the hardest thing i think either of us has ever done did you guys raise Lizzie together? We did, yeah. Uh, we got her in 2013, I guess. And she was like three months old and raised her from that point forward. One of my biggest regrets, I don't really, I got sober in 2015. And I, I have like very, very few memories of the first couple of years with the dog, which now I'm realizing like, I didn't think I had a lot of regrets in my life, but that's definitely one of them. I, Nicole will talk about something from the first couple of years with the dog, and I'm like, I just can't, I just cannot like summon a memory of what she's talking about. But uh, yeah, 2013 up until 2020, we raised the dog, and she was, uh, she was awesome. I mean, she was very, had a lot of very human like qualities, you know, she was a special, special thing. And you guys raised her together for so long, so she was kind of like your child. Yeah, and people with human children get mad when people say that about animals, but uh, I don't know. You'd be an asshole to not be able to recognize that <laughs> there's like a there's a similar relationship there, you know? Right. I'm not saying, I, I don't know what it's like to have kids, so I can't comment on that. Either way, it's a family member. Yeah, totally. And I've talked to plenty of people who have kids and have dogs they care about. And almost universally, they acknowledge it's like, if they're the kind of dog people that we are, where it's like, we treat the dog as if it's a member of the family who's like equal, 
uh, maybe not a hundred percent equal, but you know, right. <laughs> emotionally equal. Uh, and and almost universally, my friends who have human kids and dogs are like, yeah, I mean, it's it's very similar, you know. And uh, yeah, it's just it's been a hard year, man. Um, COVID and everything else aside, she died January second, and Nicole, <laughs> we were like trying to move to the Austin area for for a little bit. We have been talking about it for a long time. And then we started getting serious about it, and then that happened. Uh, and it, she, she had something called Valley Fever, and we thought we were treating it effectively, and I don't think we were. I don't think anybody ever really fully explained to us how serious it was. And so we, we thought she was all right, and then just in like a couple of weeks' time, it was like uh, she developed like an autoimmune disorder and it it was like she had cancer or something basically um, oh man it, she just it, it was it was a really really horrible two weeks um we finally had to to put her out of her misery you know and then two days after that nicole had her first round of interviews in austin uh and it so we, I, I somehow got on a flight to go with her. I got on the same flight she was on because originally I was going to stay home because we had the dog. Mm-hmm. And then when that happened, I was like, well, there's nothing stopping me from going with you now. So yeah, two days after we lost the dog, we we're in Austin looking at houses, <laughs> like, like hanging out with friends. She's interviewing for jobs. And then uh, we got back on a Sunday and then... I think it was that Monday, Marcus and I went to Tucson to record the new Spirit of Drift album. And I was I was in Tucson three to five nights a week, uh, and Nicole was at home by herself. And if you want to talk about love, like that's that is real actual love that got us through that. I look back on that and the timeline doesn't even make sense to me. Like the dog died. Two days later, we're on a plane. She's interviewing for jobs. Two days after that, I had to go. I had to like leave her, basically. Oh my god, that must have been so hard, dude. It, yeah, I don't know how we did it. I don't even know how we're doing it still. Like because then we finished the album, and then <laughs> as soon as the album was done, we moved. Uh, and she's lived in Arizona her whole life. Like her most of her family's there, uh, and all of my family's there. And we just uh, we just couldn't be in that house anymore. Being like she was there alone for for like I said three to five nights a week when we were working on the album, and then somewhere in there she went back to Austin to interview for another round of jobs, and I was in the house alone for one night I think, and I like couldn't handle it at all. And when she got back, I was like, how? how did you do that? Like, I'm amazed that she was able to, to handle that. But there wasn't a single moment where she was like, you can't do the album. Like you have to come back every night. Like there was nothing like that. There was no, and she's always been like that. That's kind of how I knew she was the person that I needed to be with because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people think they are supportive of, people who want to be in a band or be an artist or this or that or whatever. Right. Um, and a lot of times like being the dude in the band will draw women to you or men, if you're the chick in the band or whoever, whatever your preference is. Um, and, and they, you know, these people think that they want to be with the dude in the band and support the dude in the band. And when it comes down to it, like, it's hard. <laughs> it's, right. it's not that easy. You not know? only is it hard to be apart all the time, but then there's other life situations that get thrown at you, like grieving a family member, whether it's a pet or a human or like having to move or new jobs or whatever. And like all the other things that come along with life that you have to like deal with apart. Yeah, it, it's a lot to handle. And some something I've been thinking about a lot lately, too, is as I'm getting older and I don't know, just thinking about life, it, it's like you can't, 
you can't just put all your chips in on like being a dude in a band because all us dudes and bands are getting older and older women don't give a shit at the end of the day about the dude in the band like <laughs> no matter who you are you know what i mean like you right. have to have as a man you have to have a little more to offer uh cuz when you're when you're 20 it's cool it's like oh he's in a band this is cool when you're 30 it kind of starts to wear off and when you're approaching 40 it's like is this motherfucker going to like do anything like what's this what's right. this fool doing like is he going to be able to bring like is he going to be able to support you is he going to be able is he going to be there for you when times are tough is he going like it, anybody can look hot playing guitar on stage um but at the end of the day is that person going to be your other half and be there for you exactly yeah and um as hard as i work on band stuff in the past five years, I've been putting that, I, mean, I think, a pretty much equal amount of effort into just making sure that everything I'm doing is to strengthen my character and uh, be there for her and just handle, like, life responsibilities. Stuff that I used to want, like, I looked at it and I was like, oh, that sucks. I don't want to do that. Even, like, mowing the yard. When you're a kid, <laughs> you're like, this fucking sucks but i want to buy a megadeth cd so i guess i'll mow these yards you right know? now i'm like i just i just mowed part of our yard today and it feels awesome it's like almost like a meditative thing and even marriage i kind of feel that way about because she and i were both not only not uninterested in marriage we were pretty much like opposed to the idea um and i you know you you think of it as like selling out or whatever. It's a sham that the government makes you do or right. encourages you to do, or it's like, you know, you're pressured by society to do it. It's like a contract. It's a piece of paper. Yeah. I, I used to look at it that way. Um, but then something happened where I was like, well, I, I'm like an extremist. I want to, I want to experience as many different extremes that life has to offer. And so I, I experienced every extreme that there is being like a wild person to like partying and uh, borderline criminal behavior and just, just like super dangerous, insane shit. Like I've pushed that, I've pushed that literally up to like the brink of physical death, you know? So I feel like I don't think there's a whole lot more that that type of thing has to offer. So then it's like, what else does life have to offer that's <laughs> super extreme? And it's like, okay, getting married to a person is kind of extreme. Totally. That's a pretty, that's a pretty like wild thing to, to do. It, it's like a risky, kind of crazy thing to do. So you can look at it as selling out or you can look at it as like, all right, I have, I have wrung out every bit of excitement that there is from this side of life. So let me see what this other thing is like. That's know? an extremely cool way of looking at it. Like committing decades of your life to a person and making sure that they are safe and happy is totally extreme and like kind of insane. And when you think of it that way, that's like kind of exhilarating. Yeah, it is. It uh, You know, I just remember, so we've been together since... Nicole and I have been together since 2011, and I guess it was sometime in 2016, we were laying there, and she was asleep, I think, and I wasn't, which is usually the case. I'm just, like, staring at the ceiling, and I just remember thinking about, like, you know, I had basically, I've had quite a few near-death experiences, uh, but the one that I had, you know, leading up to 2015 was, like, for sure the closest I've come. I felt like uh man, I was listening to this guy that had cor coronavirus actually the other day and he he was talking about how at any given moment he felt like he could have given up fighting internally and died or he could have kept fighting internally and lived and that the choice was kind of in his hands. And 
it's weird because I was watching an Apocalypse Now documentary the other day. Martin Sheen had a heart attack in the middle of making that movie, and he said the same thing. Damn. Um, he was like, at, at any given moment, it was my choice to live, and it was my choice to die. And I know what that feels like. When I heard them say, like, I have goosebumps right now because I know exactly what that feels like. I, there were more nights than I can count when I was like, if I wanted to just stop living right now, I'm not going to wake up. Uh, for whatever reason, I, I survived that. But it gives you a, a completely different perspective. We all know that we're going to die. Like, intellectually, we understand we're all going to die. But after you go through something like that, it gives it kind of a deeper, real, it's not just some intellectual, philosophical thing. It's like a bone-deep understanding of your own mortality. And I remember just laying there in bed one night thinking, like, wouldn't it be kind of lame if one of us died and we had never gotten married? You know? And I know that sounds kind of morbid, but it was... No, it's real. Yeah, it's real. It's it's not some fairy tale romantic bullshit. It that's like the honest truth about my motivation to get married was I was like thinking about everything that she had done for me up to that point and knowing on some level that I wasn't going to find anybody and nor did I have any interest in finding anybody who's a better fit. Like I just kind of knew that that would never happen and I had no interest in that happening. And I hadn't had any interest in that happening for quite a while at that point. And so that was the the impetus. I was just like, it would be kind of a weak-ass move after all of this if we were to just not get married and then something happened and she was never my wife and I was never her husband. You know what I mean? So right, kind of stemmed from... I mean, again, I to some people maybe that sounds morbid, but to me it was like kind of cool. I think it's extremely cool. And for you to realize that is huge and to know that she's that important to you and and to recognize all the work that she's put in to your life as well as hers. Absolutely. So to to go back, you know, for anybody who doesn't know your history, um tell me a little bit about your those kind of early days in your relationship that you talk about as being, um, you know, wrought with addiction and stuff like that. Well, I, I moved to Phoenix in 2011. And before that I had lived in Arkansas and let's see. I, so I moved to Phoenix in January and I was going to this recording school that a few of my friends had gone to who had, had some pretty cool things come out of attending this school. So I was just, I, I just needed a change. I was like, let's go to Phoenix. I, I knew one person. I knew a guy named Shane Osell and I barely knew him. He does that one man band via vengeance. It's oh, like okay. literally he plays, plays drums and guitar and sings all at the same time. And it sounds like Godflesh. It's really cool. I barely knew him when I moved to Phoenix. I had met him once at a show and but I, he was literally the only person I knew even a little bit. And we're, he and I are like still best friends today, which is cool. But so I moved there in January, totally like blank slate. My drinking at this point had gotten <laughs> about as out of control as it could get. You know, I had been to the ER a bunch of times in the last couple of months and I just like barely made it out of Arkansas. So when you say your drinking was out of control, like, what? How much alcohol did that mean for you at the time? How much were you drinking every day? I don't know. That, I don't know that I could quantify it. Like, I had a blow. I had a bunch of money because I had worked this really weird gig through a friend's mom for uh, Castrol, and so I I got a check for like a whole bunch of money, uh, which is part of what like catapulted me out of Arkansas. But I just decided the last like three, four weeks was going to be a blowout. So I don't, I have no idea. Um, I know that one day in Arkansas, I drank like a, a half gallon of Evan Williams pretty much by myself. Damn. In one day, which is, yeah, I mean, that's like a handle. Uh, and who knows what else. But anyway, I, I barely make it out of the state, which a lot of people say that's the a thing with Arkansas is that it's almost impossible to get out. <laughs> that's like... <laughs> One of the many creepy Arkansas legends out there. 
uh, I get to Phoenix and I start going to school and I'm like, now I have like kind of a direction. So I'm like, all right. So I'm feeling better. I'm not drinking as much. Uh, in March, my friend from Arkansas comes out. We worked at this bar together and I was the sound guy at the bar, which consisted of like one little four channel mixer and two speakers and me turning it on and then drinking all night. Uh, but anyway, my friend who worked at this bar with me came out and he had, uh, grown up in Phoenix. So he knew some people and he was like, Oh, you got to meet my friend. So-and-so you got to meet this person. You got to meet that person. And I can't, I don't know who any of these people are, so I can't keep track of the names. But so it's St. Patrick's Day. He came out like two days before St. Patrick's. On St. Patrick's Day, he and I go out. He's like, you got to meet my friend Nicole. He keeps talking about Nicole. You you guys would like really hit it off. I know you would, blah, blah, blah. And we get to this bar and it's like pretty much just chaos. And I lose track of my friend. He's out like mingling with all these people that he grew up with that he recognizes. and. We just kind of like separate. So I'm on like the other end of the bar. We were on the patio. And I'm for whatever reason, I'm doing like Irish car bombs where you drop the shot glass <laughs> and the beer, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm like fucking out of control at this point. I, I drop the shot glass and it, it just like explodes everywhere. And Guinness goes everywhere. It goes all over this blonde girl that's like sitting on this table minding her own business. <laughs> And I'm like, shit. And the reaction was not at all what I expected because she was like a really good looking blonde girl, looked like a college kid, you know, like just a good looking, like normal girl. Yeah. But she started, she started talking shit, but she wasn't like mad, which just blew my mind. I was like, <laughs> I was so used to girls that looked that good and a dumbass like me spills guinness all over them they're gonna be pissed off you know and understandably so what did she say it was something like oh is that your first time ever doing that or something, you know <laughs> something like really sarcastic and like smart and just like busting my balls and i was like whoa that that was like really funny and she wasn't mean you know it was like she was beautiful, but she was talking to me like one of my buddies would talk to me, just to like give me shit, you know. That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I was like too nervous to talk. I don't think we talked at that point. Uh, but then some point after that, my friend Nick comes up to me and he's like, "Oh, this is Nicole, who I've been wanting you to meet." And I'm like, "This is Nicole." <laughs> You're like, oh, and, we've okay. already been so acquainted. Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was kind of like fate or something um which you know i say like i don't i don't regret what i did with my drinking and what i did to myself a because it like made me a much different person than i think i would have ever been able to be without going through that suffering but also if if i wasn't out of control spilling car bombs on people i wouldn't have met my wife maybe maybe yeah. i would have but you don't know. So I can't say that I regret my drinking because I met my wife through my drinking, which whatever, they're kind of inseparable in a weird, in a weird way. Yeah. But yeah, after that, we spent pretty much like every day together unless one of us was traveling. So you guys went from you spilling a car bomb on her to hanging out every single day, like right away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Damn. pretty much. <laughs> That's um, so cool. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy because I just wasn't used to. I it was like girls that I thought were super cool and super pretty. Just, I was used to them torturing me, if that makes sense. <laughs> like I had a, <laughs> a very spotty, like like my first first girlfriend ever, kind of set the stage for my romantic life up until I met Nicole, which was just like complete and utter heartache and uh destruction and like off just awful and i i feel like every relationship i had from i let's see i was i was like 15 when i got together with my first girlfriend and she destroyed my life over the course of the next couple of years and i wasn't a great boyfriend i was an insane like 
drunk 15, 16 year old, you know, I was right. an asshole, I'm sure. Uh, but it was just, I felt like every relationship I had after that was either like trying to get revenge on her in a weird way or like trying to get her back in a weird way. One of those two extremes, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but then Nicole, it was just like, we were buddies like immediately. We were just friends and we, there was clearly like some romantic interest from the very beginning. But we were, there was another element of it, which was just like hanging out with your buddy that you just vibe with, that you get along with. You don't, I only have a few friends that don't get on my nerves, uh, and she's one of them, you know. E even some of my best friends, like sometimes I want to kick their ass, you know. Like, <laughs> totally. That's just, that's how, that's how relationships are. Right. But she, she's one of like two or three people that, Man, it's probably more than that, but but there's a select few people that like I feel like I could spend an infinite amount of time around without getting like legitimately angry or annoyed, and she's definitely one of them. I feel like that's something that is really important to remember that like you know obviously you have to be romantically and like sexually attracted to somebody, but being able to be best buddies with somebody and be able to like I mean even in those days just like have it her be like a drinking buddy that sets a stage for like a really great relationship where you can spend your life having a great time together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crucial. And it, I think, you know, you'll hear people who are in long time relationships or marriages. So they'll, they'll be like, I knew it was different. I knew it was different. And, and you can't memory fades away over time and you kind of like the magic that was there is kind of hard to remember. But if I really think about it, it was different. Like it definitely felt there was like something completely different about it. And and we've been through some rocky stuff, you know, like we spent some time apart. Um, I guess like a year, almost a year after we got together. And it was good in a sense because we both realized that like that wasn't gonna work. Just period. It it felt similar to like the few times that I've had in my life where I wasn't playing music, I was like, okay, obviously this is not going to work. You know, right. when we were apart, that's how it felt like, okay, this is not, this is not an option. <laughs> that's, that's literally <laughs> what it felt like. Okay. Not an option. I guess we're meant to be together. I guess we have to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you guys spent some time apart, when you felt this, this pull to be back together with her, how did you, instigate that did you were you did you call her up and say like fuck this let's get back together or like how did that work <laughs> there's a funny story actually um well i guess to take it back i was only originally supposed to live in phoenix for like eight or nine months something like that and we knew that so when i finished this recording school that i was going to i moved to la and I lived uh, with this buddy of mine from high school who was out there working in the film industry. And I was out there helping this guy build a studio. And we weren't, Nicole and I weren't really sure like how things were going to proceed. And we, I think we kind of agreed that we were just going to be separate for the time being or maybe forever or something. And uh, it, it was just like miserable. And, it was so miserable being away from her that I pretty much after a couple months was just like, fuck LA. I'm going back to Phoenix and I don't even like Phoenix. <laughs> like <laughs> nothing, nothing against the people of Phoenix, but I just like, I was never meant to live there that long. It's too hot. It's, I'm not cut out to live in like a big city like that. I realized. Right. But I, I went back to, and I kind of played it off like, Actually, there was there was like a trial run because this guy I had been playing in a band with died of cirrhosis of the liver while I was in L.A. Oh wow! Actually, and um, I had basically watched this guy die. Like watched him, his faculties kind of leave him, and you know, literally like turned yellow and stuff. Which year years later, I would see that stuff in myself and be like, oh, I like this is familiar, you know? Right. I've seen the end of this story before. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so this guy passed away. I was in LA and I, I wouldn't say I used his memorial as an excuse to come back to see Nicole because I wanted to come back and I wanted to see the other guy that was in that band because um, he's my buddy, you know, and I wanted to pay my respects and stuff. They, they did like a show, like a benefit show. I did want to come back and do that, but I will say that the added bonus was thinking like, oh, maybe I could see Nicole while I'm back too and fill that out. I ironically, like this dude died from drinking and I can't even barely remember like being back because I was drinking so much, but I'm pretty sure I saw Nicole and went back to LA. And then after a while, I was just like, I just can't, can't take being away from her. So I went back permanently. We got back together. Uh, and then it was actually shortly after that, that we took a break. Um, I, you know, I couldn't speak for her. You, you'd have to do an episode with her, I guess, as to, to why that happened. Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't clicking. I think maybe she was afraid because she, before she met me, she, and she still is super independent, super, super, super independent adult responsibilities from a very young age. That's something we have in common. And I mean, she's like the most independent person I've ever met. And so I think it was really weird for her to need somebody in her life, you know, you know, need right. somebody around to fulfill certain emotional aspects. Especially um, when you guys just spent a ton of time apart in different states and all of a sudden you come back and she's like, wait a second, I like, I have a life I've built for myself here. Sure. Yeah. And she gave some things up for me, man. She was, she got accepted to, uh, to grad school in, uh, in Scotland, Edinburgh. Wow. Um, cause she has two degrees. She's got two, a degree in museum studies and a degree in art history. Rad. Oh yeah. She's, she's a lot smarter than I am. Um, <laughs> shortly <laughs> after we, we met, she got accepted to grad school and she didn't end up going, um, and you know, she there was a financial aspect to it and this, this sort of thing. But I I feel like she did that because she maybe wanted to be around me. You know, I hope that was the case. But you know, as some time went by and it got more and more serious, I think it freaked her out, and uh, all right, it just kind of st- stopped working. Some and you know, I it's not her fault. I'm not blaming her at all because right. I was a drunk fucking maniac too. Um, Things hadn't gotten super terrible at this point with my drinking. They weren't great, but I mean, I was still like functioning and doing things. Um, and then, you know, we ended up getting back together. We spent some time apart, didn't like it. Uh, I think you asked, like, how did we initiate getting back together? Yeah. Like, what was the conversation like where you were like, I can't be away from you? Well,. I remember there was like a ruse of like a haircut. Like I needed a haircut and I either like posted something on social media or something like somebody give me a haircut or something. (laughs) (laughs) And she was like, she texted me. I think I I could be misremembering the exact details of how this went down, but I know she ended up over at my apartment and she had the clippers and she cut a big ass hole in my hair, like all the way down to my scalp. (laughs) (laughs) And she was like, whoops. And, you know, to this day, I'm like, did she do that on purpose? (laughs) You know, (laughs) this motherfucker, I'm going to fuck up his hair. (laughs) (laughs) She, uh, she cut a huge hole in my, in my hair. I don't think my hair was like super long at the time, but she was all freaked out. I was like, fuck it. Shave my head. I had had a shaved head before, uh, in high school, when I got really into minor threat, I shaved my head. Actually, my friend who went to the Marines shaved my head, and he really enjoyed doing it. But so, yeah, Nicole shaved my head. Uh, at some point after that, we were at the bar where we first met. She was there with some friends. I was there with some friends, and she texted me, and I texted her. And Then at some point, I, then there was like another ruse about like movie tickets or something. Like I got two free movie tickets and I knew that she liked going to the movies with her niece or her nephew. I'm sorry. I don't think our niece wasn't born yet. I don't guess. Or maybe it was just 
No, definitely wasn't born. Yeah, she liked taking her nephew to the movies, and I had like two movie tickets. Uh, there's something to do with that. Just bullshit. There was a lot of <laughs> bullshit to reasons to just talk to her and vice versa, you know. And then finally, we just met up in person, and I was like, I want to get back together. And it's kind of like, okay. And then we just kind of started over. It's amazing when you're, when you really want to reconnect with somebody, or if you're still in love with someone, um, the paper thin excuses we find to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a lot. There was literally like movie ticket paper thin excuses, you know? So at that point, when you guys got back together, it wasn't too long after that that you eventually decided to get sober, right? We got our our whole break was in like February of 2012 till maybe like the summer of 2012, somewhere mm-hmm. around there. I didn't get sober till 2015, actually. Oh, okay, so there was like a good chunk of time there. Yeah, yeah we got Lizzie in uh, February of 2013. That I think I guess that's the next big milestone. We um we moved in together at some point. Uh we were living with my dad and taking care of him. And there was a whole lot of shit going on there, just family stuff. And she was there for it, you know. That w- that was one of the early signs of like, wow, this is like she's like really something special. You know, my, my dad was dealing with a lot of shit and we were, we were helping him out and she was there for every step of the way of, you know, and, um, then that, you know, the stuff with my dad going on, that's when my drinking got really, really bad. I would say at the end of 2012, beginning at 13 is when it started to get super ugly and we were living together. We had the dog and then 2013 to 2015, I I can't honestly say I remember much of those two years. So I, I'm not sure what I can tell you about that stretch of time, honestly, other than some things at the very end of all of that. So what, what was the point during that time that you were like, oh, fuck, I really need to get sober? Every day, every single day for uh, two years, pretty much. I mean, I had been drinking liquor every day for, dude, probably since like 2006 or something. Um, Maybe not literally every day, but basically every day from 2006 on. Definitely starting in 2012, I was drinking every single day, literally. Um, No days off. And... Yeah, at a at a certain point, it's like, even as far back as, I would say, 2007. I mean, I had, I had like deadly levels of alcohol poisoning when I was 15 years old. And I was driving a car around, like, didn't even have a license, you know. And then as far back as 2007, I had a bunch of emergency room visits from throwing up blood and that sort of thing. Um. Uh, but yeah, it's 2012, 2013, 2014, it was like, I know every single day I wanted to stop. I, and I knew, I, I said out loud many times to Nicole, like, and other people, you know, if, if I can't stop doing this, I'm going to die. Like, I'm going to die. I would say that every day. And, you know, that's how powerful addiction is. Even knowing that consciously, uh, And then also priding myself on being a sort of expert on psychology and addiction and stuff like that and how to quit. Like, oh, if you go to detox, they give you benzos so that you won't have seizures and die. So let me, I'll wake up and take half a Xanax and that'll keep me from dying and I can quit today. You know, I don't know how many days I did that. I would wake up and take half a Xanax and be like, all right, going to kick today like today's the day i stopped drinking and then by the end of the day i drank a whole bottle of wild turkey and now i also have half a xanax in my body right which could be like a deadly combination yeah that's that's the one of the killer combos for sure i I did that for three years based two two or three years at least two years 
And I, I went to visit one of my best friends in Arkansas for my 27th birthday. And I flew down there and he saw the shape I was in. And this dude can drink. I mean, he, me and him used to like get into some shit, like some serious <laughs> drinking, you know? <laughs> and uh, he, even he was like, dude, you got to stop. And I'm like, holy shit. When this guy is saying stop, like it's, it's time to stop. And I got on the plane to go back home and I was just like, the, the agony at that point is indescribable. Like it, the only way to understand how bad it is, is to go through it. And I don't recommend that anybody go through it. I wouldn't, I would literally wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Uh, I can th- I can think of who my worst enemy is right now, and I I wouldn't <laughs> wish it on that person. Um, when you say agony, are you talking about physical or or like psychological everything, agony? Everything. There's there is like something that happens to a person as they're dying from drinking alcohol. Maybe other drugs do it too. Maybe cancer does it too. I don't know because I haven't experienced that. There's a dread that is such a primitive instinctual like alarm going off inside your body and it's not a thought it's not a feeling it's like a it's an instinctive like dread and panic and it it can manifest itself in physical ways like you'll feel stuff spazzing out inside your body and uh you know, it manifests in, in mental ways. And, you know, now that I look back on it and I, I feel like I have a pretty good, like, I would call it a spiritual life. I'm not a religious person. I'm not a Christian. Don't get the wrong idea. I never will. Right. Be. I hate organized religion more now than I ever did when I was like hardline agnostic atheist type of dude, you know, but I, spiritual is just a word. And, and, I like to try to tap into that sort of thing. And looking back on it now, I was in like spiritual crisis. So it was like physical for sure, beyond any sort of words, mental for sure, uh, spiritual, I guess you would say, and emotional. And then things that there aren't even words for really like feeling, feeling stuff that's so bad and then it's bad in a way that's so hard to describe that there's not a word for it, you know? And uh, as I went through all that on that flight back. And, you know, I was thinking about, I, I had just turned 27, like the day before. I was like, how fucking lame is it if I died at 27? Like all these other assholes, like Jimi Hendrix and fucking whoever, you know, like at least right. Jimi Hendrix was badass. Like, what have I done, you know? What it Kurt Cobain died. People at- romanticize that idea so much, and then when it really comes down to it, there's nothing glamorous or exciting about that at all. Yeah, yeah. I was like, at least do something, you sack of shit. Like you, you <laughs> haven't like it, you know. I'm like Jimi Hendrix was badass. Look at all the stuff he did, and like Kurt Cobain. Look at all the stuff he did. Like don't you would just be a a fucking dork if you died at 27. Like thinking that's cool. Like and I I just. I wouldn't have wanted any of my dipshit friends to be like, man, how weird is it? He died at 27, just like Jimi Hendrix. Like, yeah, but I didn't do shit. Like, who cares? You know, like, right. It just, that thought kind of crept into my mind. Um, And, you know, you interviewed Buzz. That was your first episode, right? Yeah. I read something that Buzz Osborne said in an interview. Um, And, you know, over the course of my life, there were things that I had read and things that I experienced. That stuck in my subconscious, and they were like fucking life wraps. When it came time for me, something clicked to where I was like, I have to get sober now. You know, all these things from my subconscious Henry Rollins, uh, Waylon Jennings getting sober, like all these different people, just they, they probably never would have thought that their words would have an effect on somebody that many years later to like change their life. But Buzz is one of those people, man. He he said something in an interview about like there, and I'm paraphrasing. 
there's not a problem in the world that gets better if you pour a bottle of whiskey on it. Yeah, that's powerful. Dude, it's so simple. It's so simple. And I remember reading that interview with him and it just stuck. Like it's, st- and I, I hope I get to thank him someday for that. Um, when that plane landed, my wife was there to pick me up, a uh, girlfriend at the time. And I got in the car and she was like, dude, you don't even smell like alcohol. You smell like death. You smell like poison or something. And I literally just said, take, I was like, take my ass to rehab or detox or whatever. I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm done with this. And, uh, I guess she could tell there was like something different. And I think it was two days later I went to detox and haven't had a drink. I had quite a few drinks on the way to detox just to not fucking spaz out and glitch out, you know, but, uh, yeah, haven't had a drink of alcohol since then. I think people, it's something people don't really realize. Like when you have been consuming that much liquor every day for that many years, your body physically can't just stop. Correct. Yeah. I, I have a friend, um, man, I remember reading this on tour. I don't, I don't know when it was, maybe a few years ago. This dude I went to high school with, really, really nice guy. Basically, he did the exact same thing I did. He went to detox uh, for alcohol, and I don't know why I got to live and he didn't, but he just, he died. He, he, he went to a facility whose purpose is to <laughs> detox you from alcohol, so I don't know how that, they allowed that to happen, but, um, but he didn't make it, and um, you know, fortunately, I had some friends who had been through the process and the place I went was a shithole. It it was like a free detox for people without health insurance or money. Uh, half the people there just go there to score drugs because they ran out of smack or whatever. Right. And I mean, it was, it was pretty tough, but I, I had some friends, I, maybe several people told me like, listen, you go in, there's like general intake. You got to be in really, really, really bad shape for them to take you into an actual room, you know? So they're going to give you some food. Like if you throw up, that'll help get you in faster. If you spaz out, that'll help get you in faster. So, you know, they told me if you can eat, eat and then just throw it up immediately, which is what was happening to me at that point. Anyway, I couldn't eat food. I hadn't really been able to eat food for like a couple of years. Uh, so I got in there thinking that they would give me something to like prevent me from having DTs and dying, but they didn't. I don't know how many hours I was in there. I ate and threw up and then I actually, I didn't have to like, I didn't have to pretend to be more tormented than I was. Cause I, I was like going through the DTs and stuff and, uh, you know, I had gone up to the front desk. It's hard to piece it together because it's just like psychedelic fucking nightmare. Um, oh yeah, I bet it's like all a blur now. It sounds like an awful yeah. Even time in the moment, live. it's like, is this real? Like a dude ran in, covered in blood, running from the police. I'm pretty sure that was actually real. There was a a big ass motherfucker screaming at the girl at the front desk for a razor over and over and over. I need a razor. I need a razor pretty sure that was real um and i went up to the front and i was like hey guys i i was so out of it that i was like i checked myself in voluntarily can i just leave i didn't even know like what my rights as a human being were at this point you know i was just like wow who who am i like can i <laughs> leave what's gonna happen if i like you can't describe how poorly your brain is functioning um yeah and the, and the guy was like, yeah, you can leave, but what are you going to do? Like, he was trying to do after school special me or whatever. I'm like, I'm going to go home and take a Xanax so I don't die. And he's like, oh, wait, you have, do you have seizures? I was like, I'm having DTs right now, dumbass. Like, what the fuck do you think this is? And Yeah, why do you I think called, I came here in the first place? Yeah, I called Nicole at some point. I don't remember this, but she told me this. 
she said I called her and I was like, they're not doing shit. Like, I'm going to fucking die in here. And I guess she called them and like lit them up. And they finally gave me, like, took me back and gave me something. But wow. they, they would have just let me die, I'm pretty sure. Do they just feel like there were other people that they were prioritizing over you because their cases were worse? Or were they just yeah, too busy? Yeah, I guess busy? that's it. I, you know, there's only so many rooms. Um, so you, they have to really think that you're going to, that you're going to die if you don't get some help, but right. I don't know what it takes. Cause I really was going to die and I couldn't get any help. So, I mean, I, I don't know, but it's, you know, it's, there's no other phrase other than mind fuck to think about like my buddy that I grew up with going through the same thing and not living. And I, then I, I made it out, you know, it's like, what's, what's the different? It's, it's just, I'm glad that that part of my life is over. So how long did it take for you to detox and start to feel like a human being again? I think I was in there for three days and, uh, honestly, like whatever they gave me, they gave me a ton of drugs. And the first morning I woke up, I felt great. I felt amazing. It was like the best I had felt in probably 10 years or something. And uh, I remember I was, they had this little like patio and then there was a grass area. And I went out on the patio and I was looking around and there's all these junkies and, you know, people like me. (laughs) Uh, And there's a sign on the grass that said, do not stand in the grass. And I was like, Something in me that's always been in me was like, just because of the sign, I'm going to fucking do some Patrick Swayze, <laughs> like yoga, Tai Chi in this fucking grass right now. And that's what I did <laughs> on the first morning. I was like, went right into the middle of the grass and started doing like the sun salutation and shit and just trying to like literally trying to channel Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. Like, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> It's like the, he the was sign so saying don't get on the grass you're like fuck you i'm gonna stand on the yeah. grass <laughs> yeah i i was like patrick swayze is gonna get me through this i'm gonna like channel that shit that's <laughs> amazing and nobody said a word nobody said anything to me i did that all three days i was there um and i learned about recovery in there it, it was a it was a hellacious experience and I, at one point i had to go like I looked at the drugs, the amount of drugs they were giving me, and I had to have like a talk with the doctor because I refused to take them. And so I went in the office with this little imp fucking pharmaceutical whore doctor guy, and uh, he tried to convince me that I needed to be on all these drugs and that, oh, you're addicted to alcohol. You're not addicted to drugs. And Oh, uh, my God. Dude, I, I was like, I was in a state of mind where I literally was like ready to kill this guy with my bare hands. And I think he, he figured that out. And so they left me alone after that. And I, I just started, I was taking stuff to like stave off the DTs and that's it. But they were giving me like, everything you hear about the pharmaceutical industry is true. All the bad stuff you hear about it, it's all 100% true. And that guy in that moment was like the face of all of that shit. Yeah, to use somebody who's clearly like a shell of a human and who is already addicted to one thing to just transfer their addiction to something else so that they can make money. I mean, that's so fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the biggest memory I have, I I guess doing the Tai Chi in the, the forbidden grass and then fucking threatening (laughs) to kill that guy. Um, and then Nicole picked me up after three days and, uh, her sister was like out of town. So we went to her sister's place and it kind of gave us a break from my whole family situation that was very traumatic and stressful, you know? So, and I just started running and I wrote the first two spirit of drift songs like that week. Wow. And that was, uh, what eventually became, um, behind beyond. Yeah, I wrote those songs just verbatim, like in, in a week. 
That's so intense because those really. songs are like 12 plus minutes. So for those to be your first ever songs for Spirit Adrift is very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, it's it was real. I mean, I just, it was like I had built up a dam and the dam broke and let all the creativity and all the the music that was in me that had been just stuck in there, like poisoned, you know, it all just started coming out. And I mean, since then, I, I write a song like if I'm home, I write a song that day, pretty much. Or I try to, you know. So in that first a bit of time when you were like newly sober and trying to rebuild your life, how did that affect your relationship with Nicole? I, I feel like whenever I read about like in AA and stuff, they tell you like you shouldn't be in a relationship for a year after getting sober or or like advice websites for like how to get your partner through getting sober. Be prepared that you might be jealous while your partner figures out their new life and rebuilds their friend group or all these things or yeah i don't know i guess what i'm asking is like how how did you guys rebuild after that well fortunately she is like probably the most selfless person i've ever met um and and positive and loving people i've ever met you know some people who go through trauma it turns them into an asshole uh some people who go through trauma it turns them into like this being of just love and and giving and and that's the way that she turned out you know i probably turned out more on the asshole side but i think i'm i'm finally <laughs> starting to learn how to be cool from her you know uh she she's never really had an issue with like drinking or anything like that she actually s- stopped drinking completely uh quite a while before i did she never really cared that much about it honestly um and I, she wouldn't say this, but I know that she did that as a way to, like, show me, you know, I, this doesn't mean shit to me if you stop drinking, the, then we both don't drink. You know, she was she was right. like, she never said that. She never even brought it up. She just stopped. And I noticed, you know, um, so, so she set the stage for me to be able to stop. She kind of just stopped doing anything. She smoked weed. I don't, I hope she doesn't get mad. I mean, for talking about that, I don't think she would, but she stopped, she stopped everything. She just, she just, one day I was just like, and dude, if you're an addict to watch somebody do that is like watching somebody fucking like Jesus bringing a dead guy back to life or so you're like, how is that even possible? Like, I can't wrap my head around how you could just stop drinking and doing drugs. It's insane. So you feel like maybe she was doing that to inspire you and to be like, listen, yeah. dude, if, if I can do yeah, it, you yeah. can do it. I think so, but see, she never, she never made it about that because she's so nice that she just, she just did it and let me figure it out, you know. Do you feel like if she had, like, if she was like, "I'm doing this because I want you to see that you can stop too." I mean, just like you're talking about the forbidden grass sign. Probably, if somebody told you that, you'd be like, "Fuck you! I'm going to do the opposite." Do you think she was kind I don't of know. Like, aware of that? I, uh, maybe. Yeah. What I will say, and it's odd that you asked that because I was about to say, like, for not being like a recovery expert, she, I look back now knowing about recovery and how it works usually, she, the way that she handled it was like per- perfect. It's like eerie. She never laid down any ultimatums. There were quite a few times where she was like, I'm going to have to like, go stay with my sister because I can't watch you do this to yourself anymore. But it was never like, fuck you, like, stop drinking now or I'm going to leave. Like, and you know right. how hard that is to not say that to somebody that was doing what I was doing? Like, she never made me feel bad about it, um, which is crazy. I don't know how she knew how to do that because a lot of recovery experts aren't even that good at it. So, uh, well, you talked about how you guys sort of were just, um, you were so perfect for each other from the beginning. You know, I think communication patterns have a lot to do with that. Like when you can get to know somebody so well that you know what type of communication is going to cause a reaction and what kind is going to cause kindness or understanding. Right. She said something to me one night when I was like, 
pretty much blacked out. And I remember having this revelation of suddenly being open to like life having more possibilities and and me having some sort of spiritual purpose uh and all the negativity was like wiped from my mind and i i saw like all these possibilities for myself of like being this happy kind person and i can't fucking remember what she said and she can't either but there's a line in the song spectral savior the spirit of drift song uh I don't like to demystify things all that much, but, but there's a line in that song about that, about how like she was, she's so good at dealing with me. And I mean, I'm crazy. I'm like, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and uh, she's so good at dealing with me that she somehow like cracked a code in my stupid ass brain that allowed me to see like some sort of positive future and positive potential for my life. And again, like but what Buzz Osborne said, this was like just ammunition, ammunition, ammunition for for me to finally pull it out and use it when it was time to make that like because you can want to quit for like years. I did. I did want to quit for years. And I think maybe that made it easier for her to not give me any ultimatums or anything cuz she knew I like legitimately wanted to stop. Because it was just miserable, you know. But it takes just that one second of being like, stopping. Like, there's a shift that happens. And having whatever she said to me that one night, I wish I could remember it. I'm honestly kind of, I guess I'm kind of glad I don't remember it. Because that might, like, it might not be as cool as we thought it was or whatever, you know. But in in that moment, it was, like, perfect. And that's exactly what you're saying, like, communication patterns. She She somehow knew exactly how to verbalize something to me where it, like, broke down a bunch of my mental barriers you know that's amazing that's so fucking cool i love hearing about this stuff because it's just like you know when you're really in love with somebody and you really connect with them like that i feel like they can just sort of unlock parts of your brain that you didn't even know were there i feel like every person i've talked to so far has said something along those lines where they were just like you know it's like holding up a mirror and seeing yourself in a totally different way that's definitely true. I I know I think back to if I can genuinely think about what I used to be like and what I'm like now, there's several factors that have contributed to that change, but I think she's the biggest factor and I I it's corny when people are like she made me a better person, you know? Like that's <laughs> fucking lame, but it's true. And like I'm telling you, you know, she just the way that she lives she doesn't like flaunt it around how selfish and and nice she is she just is that way expecting no praise nothing in return and if you spend enough time around somebody like that it starts to rub off on you you know and she's i'm like a Sometimes I forget. I'm like, well, I'm not that different than I was. But really, like, come on, dude. I think about it. And I'm like, I'm a comp- in certain ways, I'm like unrecognizable. And she's pulling me over to the better end of the spectrum of how to be as a person, you know. Well, I'm really, really glad that you met her. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if you had never met Nicole? Like, where would you be right now? I'd be dead, hundred percent, hundred percent dead. <laughs> like no question about it. I'm serious. Yeah. There's no fucking way I would be alive. I mean, killing yourself with alcohol and drugs is pretty. Mo- I, I I'd imagine it's like the loneliest thing a person could do. It's uh, because that addictive fucking demon, whatever it is that's in you it it's hell bent on like isolating you from anyone that wants to actually help anyone who loves you and anyone who could like get that addiction out of you or help get that addiction out of you and beat that addiction it it's like a fucking virus or something like it knows how to survive and one of the things it'll do is it manifests in your personality and you get 
shitty with the people that love you and you push them away and you it forces you to isolate because its goal is to kill you i don't know why i don't know why that exists i mean it's kind of yeah it's <laughs> like what's the point of that you know it's so screwed up that somebody that like the world has a thing like that <laughs> that you yeah, can become hopelessly addicted to that will kill you it's i mean obviously insane. there's a million substances that will do that but to have some yeah. to have one that's like readily available in stores that we can just buy and it's legal and totally uh socially acceptable is wild yeah and you know i i loved drinking up until it stopped working like it you know i loved it because it fixed every issue that i had every like mental issue that i had was gone when i was drunk and then it just stopped working if it was still working i would probably be dead like if it never stopped working i would have never stopped drinking you know i like right, it you wouldn't have much. a reason to yeah but but anyway it one yeah one of the things it does is isolate you it's a it's like the most lonesome endeavor that i'm aware of is is dying that way from addiction and um she managed to make it through that i don't know how and just like stuck with me until i figured it out and i don't think there's anybody else alive that would have done that so when i say i would be dead if i hadn't met her i literally i mean that you know so this is kind of a personal question so if you don't want to answer that that's totally fine but one thing people talk about a lot is when they get sober after many, many years of drinking, that it becomes very difficult to have sex right away. Like, did you experience any problems like figuring out how to be intimate with her again after your body was like going through detox and everything? Anybody that says that wasn't drinking the way that I was drinking because it, it was pretty much impossible for a long time because I was like almost dead. I was like literally... It's kind of hard to have sex when you're dead, you know? Right. <laughs> and I, I was, like, literally dead. So, no, I experienced the opposite. It, it was... And you're there emotionally, more important than anything, and it it becomes, like, a beautiful thing again. And whereas before, it was just, like, everything in my life was ugly. Everything. Um, it was just poisoned. Everything, every aspect of my life was poisoned. And then, and then it wasn't. So, I mean, you have to imagine, like, if you're walking around poisoned and everything sucks and then you are cured, like, that's what happened with that aspect of life and with every other aspect of life. It became, I mean, the sex could just be an analogy for every aspect of life. It was, mm -hmm. it became pure again and real and better just every everything became better uh, almost instantaneously i think that's a really powerful thing for a lot of people to hear you know probably i i bet somebody listening right now is struggling with alcohol and worrying about what will happen to their life if they do get sober or w wondering if things will be good again or being able to rebuild their life and so even something as just basic and and maybe even like surface level as hearing that sex will be better <laughs> might might inspire somebody to change their life. Yeah, I hope it does, man. I you know, I remember uh when I made the decision to get sober. Here is a an internal dialogue that I had. Okay. I'm never going to have fun again. But that looks more appealing to me than dying from this. Like, dying the way I was dying was so shitty that I was willing to accept not ever having fun ever again. Because I was like, sober people don't have fun. That's a crock of shit. Like, I know sober people. They're full of shit. They're laughing <laughs> and shit. No way. I'm like, no, they're just faking it. Like, they're miserable. They all wish that they were high and drunk right now <laughs> you know right. I, that's i believe that i believed all right never having fun again but it's better than this shit and uh that's just a fucking lie that's a lie that addiction does a lot of things and it i i almost really look at it as like a physical entity or some kind of entity some sort of fucking 
Alex Jones is always talking about interdimensional fucking psychic vampires and shit. Hey, that's not a bad way to describe addiction. I don't, I'm not signing off on it. anything Alex <laughs> Jones is saying. That's a really funny thing, thing to me. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, but like interdimensional psychic vampire is a lot like what, what addiction feels like, you know, and it, it lies to you. It tells you that without it, you're, it's like an abusive relationship. It's like, without me, you're never going to have a good time again. And I, I'm a smart guy, but I believe that. I believe that. That's how deep into that shit I was. And I'm like, now I look back on all the times that I thought I was having fun. And I'm like, that was bullshit. That wasn't fun at all. I remember what it actually felt like. And I'm like, dude, I've just felt like my insides were on fire and I was having 18 panic attacks at the same time every day. Like, that's not fun at all. Yeah. God, that's, that's, Really, really, really intense. Not only panic attacks while it's happening, but probably panic attacks the next morning, panicking about what you did or said, or how oh, it's I mean, affecting it's, your social life. It it goes, yeah, definitely. But but it goes past that. It goes to a stage where every waking second is just torture. It's just torture. You feel like you're falling off a cliff, like panic attacks that don't even relate to anything and that compound on one another and that you know is i just can't i can't describe it you just have to i think that's why there's such a camaraderie with people uh who are in recovery is like yo if you made it out of that you are a hard ass motherfucker like good for you you know <laughs> like it's the it's the worst thing i've ever experienced for sure so at the beginning of our conversation you were talking about how, you know, a lot of people fantasize about the idea of like being with a dude in a band and that it's like not like the fantasy world of that is very, very different than the reality. Do you feel like that fantasy is kind of hard to separate yourself from sometimes? It's not for me. Um, I was never, you know, I played my first like live concert. I was in eighth grade and this chick that was like too cool for everybody. Not only has she never talked to me before or not only has she never like made any sort of physical contact with me. She had never even talked to me before. She ran up and hugged me after we played this fucking shitty cover of Tourette's by Nirvana. <laughs> and I, I like it. It felt good. It felt good. But immediately I was like, this is bullshit. Oh my God, this is bullshit. Like I figured out immediately, like, that's not real, you know? You can't base any sort of lasting hope for happiness or a a life of any sort of purpose, you know, off of that because it's bullshit. So I, I think it's extremely hard for people, once they're even a little bit famous, to form relationships that they can trust are a hundred percent genuine. And I don't even think, especially in America, I don't, I don't really feel like other countries are as toxically obsessed with the idea of fame as Americans are. Right. But especially for Americans, like if you got a little bit of clout or a little bit of fame, the amount of bullshit that comes flowing in is like impossible to even comprehend. And so, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine trying to like start a, a relationship. It's hard enough just to even start like a friendship with a new person, but to start a, any kind of romantic relationship, you'd just be questioning like, does this person actually like me or is this like based on something else? And Nicole and I talk about that a lot. Like I, I listened to your episode with Kenny from Typo mm -hmm. and, and, uh, Man, how f I, I just all I can think of was like, how fortunate is this guy that he met his wife before typo negative got huge? So he <laughs> totally. knows it's real. He fucking knows it's real. A lot of guys would be like, and I guess there's a part of me that still understands this, like, oh bummer for Kenny, man. He was married the whole time he was in typo negative, you know? Of course. He was tied down. Like, but I look at it like, yo, he's got something that he knows is real, you know? And I feel that way. 
I'm not nearly at the level that dude is. Um, but I feel like if that day ever comes, I know I got something real. I don't have to worry about, like, Nicole doesn't give a fuck about, uh, let me be clear about this. She has supported me more than anybody I've ever met with the music thing. Uh, her and my grandparents. I was raised by my grandparents. She, Nicole has been like so supportive, it's insane. That being said, she doesn't give a fuck, which is cool. I love that. She's not like, she doesn't even like to tell me if like somebody at work says something about like Spirit of Drift or something. She's like, because ah, she doesn't give a fuck. Like, she likes me for who I am. Right. She knew me before I'm getting this sort of recognition for the music and everything else. And she, you know, she's very picky with metal too. And, but she doesn't give a fuck about like the metal world or any of that, which is so awesome because most people that That's I know. That's so refreshing. Most people I know like care about that shit. I care, I guess I care about some of that stuff. Um, but it's cool to just to have a partner in life that's like i'm very proud of you but i don't give a fuck about like any of that other stuff you know yeah i think that's extremely important and i mean not not just for romantic partnerships but just for like remaining sane in this crazy world that you and i both operate in i think one of the reasons that I'm able to stay as in love with rock and roll as I am is that most of my best friends have nothing to do with this world. <laughs> yeah. And so I can yeah. like, I can go, well, that's work. And of course, I have many dear friends that are in that world and I love them with all of my heart. But my oldest friends in the world don't give a fuck that I met a famous person or that I interviewed so and so. They're like, oh, I heard you have a podcast. That's nice. <laughs> that's crucial. That's so crucial. Yeah. You know, I the older I get and uh kind of like the bigger the band gets and stuff, the more I value like I've been bringing up a lot of my old high school friends during this conversation it's because I'm talking to like all of my best friends growing up because again, that's something that I know is real. And you know, pretty much all of them love the the band. Uh we all grew up listening to a lot of the same, you know, Black Sabbath and everything else, but uh, I just know I value those relationships so much now because I just know they're real, and uh, yeah, that's that's very important. I just I remembered a story just now that is a perfect example of what I'm talking about with Nicole. Uh, <laughs> I was in a band in Phoenix, and the drummer had worked with Trevor from Obituary in phoenix for a oh, while cool. <clears throat> so we went and hung out with him one day he was in town and to listen to leonard skinner and got like, so drunk on coors light and stomped a pair of sunglasses at some point but anyway we, it was just like <laughs> one of those we were hanging out in a garage listening to leonard skinner and breaking stuff and oh, that sounds we great. ended up <laughs> yeah no it was great <laughs> trevor's the nicest dude ever but we ended up going to my house uh where nicole and i were living with my dad and it was like one or two in the morning or something and we had the dog at that time I remember lizzie was there and so me and the drummer from my band and trevor from obituary come staggering in the front door and nicole was up and it, i was like she knew i was hanging out with trevor from obituary i kept saying trevor from obituary trevor from, you know it was like <laughs> big deal and so we got there and she was up and the dog was there and we all got down on the floor playing with the dog and shit. And um, I was like, this is Trevor. And she's like, hey, what's up? And she just treated him like, like she just didn't care at all. She wasn't mean to him or anything. But like when they left, I was like, dude, that was, that was Trevor from obituary. And she's like, cool. You know, that was it. <laughs> so, I bet nice. Trevor it's, appreciated yeah. that too. That you know he's being treated like a human being. <laughs> I oh, imagine 100%. that gets very difficult sometimes. Yeah, no, I see it from a little bit from the other side. Now is like, yeah, that's just how you, you should treat everybody the same, no matter what, because they are the same. They're all just people. So again, that's a, a good lesson that I learned from my wife. You know, I've learned a lot of them. 
Yeah, just to to remain grounded and remember why you're friends with people and it has nothing to do with their clout or their fame or how talented they are. It's how they make you feel and what good times you can have together. (laughs) Absolutely. So have you ever written a song about Nicole? They're all about Nicole. Aw. One way or another, they're, yeah, all of them. That's... You know, of all the answers I could have been anticipating, that is not one that I... (laughs) That kind of caught me off guard with how adorable that is. That's awesome. I'm not just saying that to get points. Like, uh, No, I know. You know, I've I've said in in basically every interview that I have a chance to say it, I'm like, Spirit Adrift and my life are inseparable. They're almost just the same thing. It's hard to explain, but... The ups and downs of the band, the cycle of the band, the cycle of the albums and tours, it's so inherently connected to my personal life that that it just can't be separated. And the biggest thing in my personal life is Nicole. She's the thing I think about the most, the thing that motivates my actions the most, the reason why I brought these two fucking psychotic wolves into our house and raise them <laughs> during a pandemic like everything i do is for her in one way or another it may not seem like it um but I, everything i plan like my whole plan for the future everything so if our spirit of drift songs are honest songs like I, i'm not i won't make a song that's not honest and telling the truth and they're all about my life, so how could they not all be about her, you know? That's really, really, really beautiful. And, and again, I know that you weren't just saying that to get points. <laughs> I was just kind of like <laughs> taken aback. That was awesome. Um, yeah, no, she would so- She would know. She would be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. She seems cool as hell. <laughs> I hope yeah, I get to meet her one really day. Cool. I hope so, too. So, my last question for you is, after this many years of being in a relationship with her and being married, what advice would you say you've that you, that you could impart to other people about what you've learned about how to have a great relationship? Well, you're as perfect of a soulmate as you can find. It's not possible for two people to not ever get on each other's nerves a little bit or have some sort of disagreement or or uh diverging perspectives on a situation or something like that. Mhm. So I think it's the biggest thing is to communicate. That's crucial and communicate openly and honestly but maybe without not communicating in the heat of emotions is big. Like even if you're feeling a lot of emotions, maybe figure out a way to separate those emotions out, communicate effectively if you're in like a heated situation and just understand the other person's perspective. And like everything else, try to focus on the good things rather than the things that might not be so good. So I have traits that annoy her and she has traits that annoy me and we work on them but you know we are who we are and you just got to focus on the good things rather than the bad things and whether that's the person you're with or the situation you're in or yourself or life or whatever like just try to focus on the good you know cuz there's always plenty of good there if you're alive there's something good you make something up, shit, you know? There is something good. So, yeah, I guess just communicate and be, be honest. And, you know, if you're in a band, don't fucking cheat on your girlfriend or your wife, dumbass. Like, why have one? It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. That's some pretty basic shit, but a lot of people do it, you know? Yeah, I, I actually meant to ask you that earlier, like when we were talking about how people in bands get treated and and vice versa is that i mean i obviously 
the world is very different than it was a long time ago in the, you know, the crazy times of like the seventies and eighties and all that. But, and also there's people taking video everywhere you go and like everything is on social media, but do you feel like it's still a very accepted thing that a lot of people just go on tour and cheat? It happens. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to snitch anybody out. I, you know, well, I'm not asking you to name names. <laughs> but most l- listen. Most of my best friends who I respect the most don't do it. I'll say that. I know a lot of people Good. that don't do it. I don't really fuck with people that. To me, it's one of the many things that's gross about it is it's just weak. I don't like weak shit anymore. I used to be very, very, very weak. And I, when I say weak, it has nothing to do with physical strength or masculinity or or anything like that. It's right. like there's there is a right way to treat people and there's a wrong way to treat people. We we as people know what's right and what's wrong. And when you're out there fucking around, you're putting what you want which isn't even really that big a deal. Like it's not that great of a payoff. But you're still putting that over the well-being of this person that you love when it could fucking destroy their life, you know? It's just not it's not worth it. It's weak. There's no other word to describe it. It's just some weak shit. And I've found, honestly, that people are respectful of dudes that are married, for the most part. And it's how you put yourself out there. Like, if you're, if you're married, but you're trying to get laid on tour, you probably get laid on tour. If you're married and you have no interest in it, I think people pick up on that and are respectful of it, you know? Right. Hopefully they can see your ring and they can just go. Yeah, I mean, just guy. a vibe, just a vibe, dude. Like, look, guys that f- fucking cheat on their spouses or girlfriends or whoever, and they're like, "Oh, it just it just happened." It, you were putting it out there, dude. Don't it fucking just happened. front again. <laughs> I'm just not here to snitch anybody out, but like, come on, motherfucker. We all know that. It's not just falling out of the sky. Like, you didn't just trip and fall into somebody. Like, you're putting a fucking intention out there. And intention's very important to me. Like, and I, it would make me a piece of shit hypocrite if I try to do this whole band in my whole life about, like, we got to be good to each other. We got to lift each other up and then be out there doing that kind of shit, you know? Right. And that makes perfect sense. Well, Nate, thank you so much. I'm just honored that you'd share all that stuff with me, not only about your relationship, but also, you know, about the dark parts of your life that you overcame. And it's funny, like, I've read so many interviews with you over the years and talked to you in person, but hearing it all laid out like that was really, really cool and makes a lot of sense for why your music is the way it is. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. And I'm, uh, I'm glad I got to share about some stuff that I haven't really been able to go in depth about that i think is pretty crucial for the band and understanding where i'm coming from artistically you know so thanks for having me of course this episode of hot blooded was hosted written and produced by me cat jones it was edited and co-produced by evan dulaney and the theme song was written by jordan olds the logo was made by Corey Largent, who goes by Insane Clam Pasta on Instagram, and additional graphics were made by John Amaya. Thank you so much to everyone who subscribed on Patreon, but especially to those who subscribed to the Lover tier, Janet Talenko davis Mark Bassett, Rob Menzer, Ryan Cardi, Ronnie Rodriguez, and the band Drug Salad. If you love this podcast and want me to keep making these, I would love it if you subscribed. You can find it at patreon.com slash hotbloodedpodcast. This month, 20% of all Patreon money will go toward the Ochre Project, which is an organization that helps Black trans people get food, shelter, and whatever else they need if they're on hard times. If you ever want to shoot us a tip but don't want to subscribe, you can also cash app us at Hot Blooded Podcast. I also want to let you know that since doing this interview, Spirit Adrift actually released a surprise EP on Bandcamp with all proceeds going toward the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And not only is it a great cause, but the EP is so good. 
It has a gorgeous acoustic version of their song Angel and Abyss, and it also has covers of Rocky Erickson and Jimi Hendrix songs. And the whole thing's only $3, so definitely check it out. You can find it at listen.20bucksbin.com. To learn more about the show, head to hotbloodedpodcast.com. And if you have any comments, concerns, or love letters, you can send them to me at hotbloodedpodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next week. 